Uh, the title of this um, conference is, oh, here's another question, thank you, um, is Faith in the Future. Uh, it's tempting when you're celebrating a 30th anniversary to look back and to say, okay, what's been done in the past? But that's all done. What counts is the future. What counts is how are we going to address and tackle uh, some of the crucial issues facing us in our lives, in our society, in the years ahead. But at the same time, it's fantastic to have the past. You know, uh, Hebrews 11 begins, uh, sorry, Hebrews 12 begins with this fantastic verse that says, since we are surrounded by such a, a great cloud of witnesses, yeah, let us um, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And we have a witness here today. Well, we've only got his chair, William Carey's chair. It says, uh, I can read this, used by, or the, uh, anyway, it says something about the William Carey in Serampore, yes, chair of William Carey in Serampore. So somehow the church here doesn't know how it got back to St. Andrew Street Baptist in Cambridge. But here it is, and William Carey pursued that calling and that vision that God gave him at incredible cost. And, um, you know, he sat on this chair, presumably, to do some of that work of Bible translating, of thinking about the, the social issues and um, challenges in Indian society, how to apply the Bible into the reform of, of India, fantastically. An amazing legacy. So we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We've got an incredible, um, uh, some examples of others who've gone before, like uh, Wilberforce, um, others associated with Cambridge, and if you go on the walk this afternoon, you'll learn some more. But what are we going to do as we go into the future? How can we stand on the, the shoulders of giants? <laughs> How can we um, be inspired uh, to, to go forward? So that's a little bit what this conference is about, bringing out some of the thinking and some of the ideas that we need in order to um, Understand the times, that lovely verse about the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. How well are we understanding the times and what should we therefore do? So these are the challenges that we, that we have before us. And um, we've got some questions here just to kick us off and um, we'll open it up for, for discussion a little bit later. But let's, uh, let's start. Do you want to pass them back to me and let's have a look, see where we begin. Um, here's one for, um, for Paul. It's simply this question, uh, Wilberforce or Wesley, I guess, in terms of the, the kind of transformation uh, that each of them was involved in, what, how, which of those is more of an inspiration or example for us going forward with the kind of problems you've talked about? Well, in one sense, um, Wesley's sort of inspiration of the 18th century revival uh, was a socially transformative event in and of itself. Uh, so historians often think, why did England not have a revolution uh, like France in the late, 19, uh, late uh, 18th century and have to conclude that uh, it was partly the evangelical revival that did it because many of the uh, social conditions in England at the time were as bad as France uh, then. Uh, the monarchy middle of the um, 18th century was more unpopular uh, at one point, uh, but England avoided that uh, despite uh, at the beginning of the, night of the 18th century having an even worse uh, moral climate of alcoholism and a breakdown of relationships. Um, so, of course, in one sense, Wesley, uh, from what Mike was also saying, the, the preaching of the gospel is always the church's main focus. Uh, but that uh, then leads to social transformation, and then that transformation can have uh, gospel-promoting consequences as well. So what we're, I think we're saying is that it's not either or, it's, it's both and. Because in one sense, Wilberforce was taking the gospel message of freedom from debt, freedom from sin, freedom from slavery, spiritually, 
and then saying the logical implication of that is that living that out means that no one should be a slave. And you'll see this both in Old and New Testament, that this idea of, this is why we have, the Jubilee is there, this is why the freedom from uh, the debt cancellation of, is there in Deuteronomy. It's a picture that then is used of redemption both in Old and New Testament. So it's, these are mutually reinforcing uh, sort of actors. Uh, they embody the gospel uh, and then can be used to promote the gospel and explain it. <coughs> I agree with everything Paul said. Just, um, I, I think often the impact of Wilberforce on the spread of the gospel in England in the 19th century is underestimated. The anti-slavery campaign was huge and obviously much more widespread than just by Christians. In fact, I had a, a great, great, great grandfather who was uh, called William Smith, MP for Norwich, who was part of the Clapham sect, but he was a Unitarian MP. So he was not part of that close um, sort of evangelical Christian um, group that Wilberforce was, was a part of or led, um, but he contributed to the campaign. But I think it was the credibility that it gave Christianity and the relevance it gave Christianity that helped um, the enormous growth of the church in England uh, in, in the first half of the 19th century, which was absolutely amazing and which carried over to the second half of the 19th century. So um, in one of the books we wrote called Relational Justice, there was a, a Jewish um, sociologist from Reading who pointed out that in the... Um, rapid urbanization between 1850 and 1900, when conditions in Britain cities were at their worst, every decade, crime fell in the British cities um, in that 50-year period. And he said the reason for that, in his view, was the Sunday school movement. But why did the church grow so huge in that period? What drove it what, what drove its growth? I think a, a large part of, of it was the relevance given to Christianity, of, of Christianity in the public's mind through the anti-slavery campaign and the work on, of Shaftesbury on limiting working hours and children and so on. Our next question is for Julian. And it's this, what is self-respect and authenticity for a baby? And that obviously picks up on, on the point that um, the, the, the postmodern ethic of self-creation um, collapses when we start thinking about children. Uh, and it becomes very patent that it doesn't work. And it's even more extreme with a baby. <laughs> um, there is no such thing as self-respect and authenticity for, for a baby. Um, and, and it's interesting, every now and then you see um, instances of the, the the, the pathological instances of the postmodern ethic uh, cropping up, and, and, and people take notice, and then they die away again. Um, a few years ago, when I was thinking about this, uh, we just had that incident when um, one of the, uh, was it Channel 4? Uh, I think it was Channel 4, but forgive me if I'm wrong on that, put on a sort of Big Brother-style program in which they got a load of teenagers in to live in a house together for a couple of weeks under Big Brother style conditions. And, and the whole thing went, went horribly wrong and, and they started doing all sorts of nasty things to each other. Anyone who's read William Golding's Lord of the Flies would have been able to predict that. And, um, and the defense of the, the producers was but they consented. They agreed to do it, as if that was an answer. But they, I mean, it's just a wonderful, horrible example of the, 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 the ethic of self-creation. You know, let's just put children together in, a, in an uncontrolled environment and see what they make of themselves. And what they make of themselves, oh dear, it doesn't look too good. Now, at that point, this is just open territory for Christians to say, this is the fall. This is human nature. This is how, you know, this is something that tells us something about what we human beings are and how we relate well to each other and why the postmodern sort of ethic of self-creation and, and authenticity and all that lot just doesn't actually work. It's not liberating. It's not fulfilling for human beings. So, yeah, I mean, where, where is it for a baby? It doesn't exist. But we do need those rather striking instances to sort of shake us up every now and again. And then we need churches and, and pastors and ministers to be 
you know, in their pulpit saying, don't you see, that is our culture. Let's start addressing it. Let, let's do something about it. Yes, we, um, in the film that we're going to show for the final part of our morning, um, we take four different ideas, and one of them is individualism. And the point we try and bring out um, uh, is that it began with something good. Individuality is good. It is right. God has made every single person unique, and through that uniqueness, we, we have accountability, we have responsibility. So individuality is good, but when you uproot that from uh, our, our, the relational context in which we've been created and we try and say uh, an individual can be autonomous entirely and self-creating and self-defining, it becomes a destructive thing. So the, the problem, to correct the problem of individualism is not a kind of a, a communitarianism or whatever, it is, it's rather to recover the God-given sense of individuality and root it again in the relational environment that gives individuals meaning uh, and purpose and so on. Um, let's come back uh, to a question here. I'm going to give this to Mike, because I know you've been thinking about student debt. Uh, it's, an issue, it's an issue for lots of reasons. Um, willingness to take on more debt uh, results, uh, yeah, results in yeah, this, this willingness to take on more debt, indebtedness for the rest of your working life. But there's no choice in higher education now. So what, what might the solutions be? Pass that back to um, Paul, actually, because <laughs> this is something that he knows a lot more about than I do. Um, if <laughs> okay, so the way uh, student indebtedness is conducted in the UK is not as um, sort of ferocious or vicious as in the US. Uh, there are sort of elements of a graduate tax built into the borrowing. So uh, you don't, if you're low paid, you don't have to pay. It's cancelled after 30 years. Uh, and then as your earnings rise, uh, you pay more. So it's not, it, it's a sort of hybrid between a pure debt and a bit like a graduate tax. Uh, but probably constructed like that because of the concern that if, it's, if it was a pure tax, every graduate paid 2% more income tax for the rest of their life, uh, then that would start disincentivizing people staying in the country, for instance. So you could you lose your tax base because it migrates. Um, so there, it, it, its implementation is not as bad, although... Interestingly, even if you were to start at a relatively high initial wage when you graduate and you earn uh, in line with the rest of the economy, uh, the repayment process means you will still not repay the debt by the time of 30 years. So it's almost designed to keep you in debt for your, most of your working life. Uh, there was initially an idea that either you, could, you weren't going to be able to repay or you were going to face a big penalty if you paid back early. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, but um, uh, I think that's uh, been dropped and you can repay early. I think my big problem with it is that it is a sort of way to keep a person under the thumb. The system is looking for drones. It wants to keep people compliant, keep them working, not striking, and, and lose their independence because you're then going to be a much more cooperative worker if you do that. I'm, a, I'm afraid this is why Mrs. Thatcher sold off the miners' villages' houses uh, and subsidized mortgages to them uh, in the 1980s so that People were in debt, workers in debt are much less bolshy. Uh, and you're seeing this in the US now, that um, the gap between rich and poor uh, is growing dramatically. Income distribution is the most unequal it's been in US history. It's even now even worse than it was in the late 1920s. Um, because you've got this um, sort of the 80, 90 percent of the workforce is now forced to take lower and lower wages whilst those that top, particularly suppliers of capital, 
are taking more and more of the income structure. And hence we wonder why people haven't got money to consume any longer and why we're not growing um, particularly quickly. It's because wages have been uh, suppressed so much. Um, so I think my principled objection is around that idea that get people in debt early and you'll keep them under the thumb. People in, in the US are looking at their whole working life now uh, in debt. Uh, an anecdote, I had a, a Christian friend who's um, thinking of training to be a pastor or a missionary. He was dating a girl in uh, the church I know in America. Uh, she's a lawyer. Uh, he asked her what her student debt was and to think about whether he should pursue her to marriage or not. And she said, she said her debt was $300,000. She was in her early 20s. Uh, and I'm afraid the relationship then ended uh, because he could not assume that bride price. That is now for the, future, the husband, that's your, the cost of the wife, as it were. You're taking on that level of debt as an obligation of yourself. And so this is the problem. You, you in debt yourself early on, and then this is the burden. This is the break on personal freedom. And in a sense, the, the social outworkings of the Christian message is God wants us to be free as stewards of his creation, not enslaved to others. Talks about you've been mulling over the idea of a, a, a kind of a jubilee debt release on student debt. Do you want to say a thing or two about that? Um, yes, I just want to add a footnote about this compliance problem because I think it's a major structural issue um, in British society now, as, as Paul has indicated. When I was fun, uh, fighting the Keep Sunday special campaign, I could not get the whole union movement to come out strongly against Sunday work. I went to see one of the leaders of one of the biggest unions, the Transport and General Workers Union, and I said, come on guys, you must be against a seven day week, even if you're only against it, because at the moment, if people work on a Sunday, they get double time or treble time, and if Sunday work comes in, you're going to lose all of your premium payments for Sunday work, which has actually happened, of course, they have lost them all. And the guy said to me, but we can't support, we cannot support, um, um, s your campaign to keep Sunday special because our, our own workers won't back it. So I said, well, why won't your workers back it? They don't want to work on a weekend, do they? He said, no, they certainly don't want to work at a weekend, but their problem is that they're all in debt. And the only way they can service their debt is by working on a Sunday and getting these premium payments. So I said, well, they won't keep the premium payments. They said, they're not worried about that. They're worried about paying tomorrow. Two or three years out is in the distant future for them. What they're worried about is, can they pay their debts next week? And that depends on them having Sunday work, and therefore they're not going to back your campaign. And I just thought, very interesting, you can have a sort of conspiracy theory that actually the employers, the banks, and everyone are conspiring to keep everybody in debt because that makes a compliant workforce, no strikes, and so on. You've noticed how few strikes we have these days. People can't afford to strike if they're in debt. But it may not be a conspiracy. It may be kind of, well, this system actually works for us pretty well, so why change it? Uh, but you asked me something else, uh, which was about a, a jubilee. <laughs> yes, I, of course, went to my main uh, advisor on financial affairs, who's sitting on my right, and said, you know, what would it cost us if we were to write off all the student debt, and what would the consequences of that be? So rather than repeating his advice... I'll pass the microphone. <laughs> Can you remember the answer? I think it was about 46 billion or something. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember now. I, I was trying to check up the numbers of how much student debt there is in the UK, and I, I think I, I haven't got the right number, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat those. Um, but yes, clearly, uh, for the last seven or eight years or so now, we've... Uh, had more and more emphasis on students paying uh, for tuition fees, for support, and then having the ability to borrow that. And so you, you've got this, the longer it goes on, if you then start cancelling that just by fiat, 
then you've got this equity issue about where's this coming from and, and so on. So uh, once you start down this road, uh, it then becomes difficult to back out. Uh, now, of course, you can, you can probably try and offer a way of cancelling that debt in return for a, an income tax premium on the same people. So they would pay for it, but it would be much further in the future, and it would be through the income tax system rather than a debt. Uh, I am going to add something to that. Um, one of my MP friends said to me that uh, the government was thinking of selling off the student debt to a third party. And that would mean that that third party who bought that debt at a knockdown price, so I think he told me, if my memory is right, that the debt was estimated to be worth about 40, 45 billion, and they would sell it off for maybe 10 billion before the election, have 10 billion more in the government coffers, make the government figures look better on a very short-term basis. But the person who bought that debt would have an interest in screwing every single cent out of whatever student there was to try and get the money back. And that would really shift the playing field enormously. Now, it's a bit more complicated because some of the early student debt was taken on on a different basis than the later student debt, and you have to get into all the details of how this would work. But um, I was trying to persuade him that what the government should do was not go down the route of, of selling it off, but, but actually having some moratorium system, some offer to put it into the tax system, uh, but, but basically try and wipe the slate clean in some way. Now, there is moral hazard in that, in the sense that if some parents have faithfully paid for their children's education, and therefore the student has no debt, but, but other parents have said, no, we're going to keep our money to go on nice holidays and let our children pay their own tuition fees and accumulate the debt, and then that debt gets written off, the parents who sacrifice to pay for their students are big losers, and that just seems desperately unfair. You really need to announce these things as the Jubilee did, or the seven-year cycle of cancelling all of debt, so it's known in advance that that is what is going to happen, rather than doing it sort of ex post. So uh, the biblical cycle of cancelling debt every seven years, which I think is something which God would see as normative, not something which is nice to have, not something which we can say, oh, that was interesting they did it in Israel, maybe we could do something like that, kind of with our typical arrogant kind of approach to the Bible, but something which we should say, this is a serious um, proposition that God is interested in and wants to see in, it, you know, embedded in the way a society operates, that all debt is written off every seventh year, and therefore we should work out our economic system to make that possible. It's a, just a totally different approach, but it's quite difficult to do it the first time. I've got a, uh, <clears throat> a question here about education, uh, saying it's not, as a means of change, it's not been uh, discussed today even though this city is particularly focused on the idea. Um, I want to connect this with a question to Julian, in that um, you say that you know, there's this Trojan horse that's being brought in to the city, as it were, uh, into the culture, um, and it's, there's a crucial uh, need and opportunity for Christians to be able to unmask it. Now, educationally speaking, what, how might... Uh, what might a campaign or, or an initiative look like to try and bring the kind of clarity we need in, into this area? Thanks, yes. It's something um, I was challenged to think about a few years ago. There was a, a big project uh, run by several of my colleagues thinking about the transformation of the university and, and the impact of Christianity and theology on the university and, and the relationships that, that, that exist or should exist between Christian thought and higher education. Um, and there is a, um, there's a real tension there because when you think practically as somebody who works within higher education as to what universities actually do, um, the idea of a Christian university becomes quite hard to, to work through. So what I mean is, I'd even take a, a discipline of my own like law, uh, if we were to imagine a completely Christianized law curriculum that still satisfied the professional qualification requirements of the law society and the bar, that still set young people up to be practicing lawyers in future life, 
the subject matter of what we would have to teach would consist largely of contract law and the law of civil wrongs and criminal law and criminal process and uh, judicial review and housing law and you know, the, the detail of the substance of what they have to know or what you want to teach them would be 80%, 90% of what we currently teach them. But then around the edges, you would want to be locating that within a Christian framework and, 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 and th in Christian critique and asking questions like, well, are the current standing rules that give access to judicial review which allow us to challenge local authority decisions, are they right? That's quite a complex technical question, but I imagine that Christians might have some sort of a view, or at least they might have a debate about it. So what we conceive of then is something that is not very different from what we currently have, but is, is set embedded in a context that is, is framed by the Christian belief and practice. Now, we're now faced with the question, how, how, what do we do next, practically? And it struck me that the way forward is not to have grand ideas about creating Christian universities, which then live with this really difficult tension of how Christian, how what counts as Christian. Do you let um, non-evangelicals become faculty members? And what do you do? What, what, what are the faith commitments you require of you? All sorts of horrible practical questions. You don't want to go there. What we want is parallel education. We want summer schools. We want our young people to be going on gap year programs which are tailored towards their future uh, university programs. So that as they come into university, they're already thinking Christianly about biology and history and geography and medicine and engineering and law and all those sorts of things. Or maybe um, one evening a week for a semester, they're going off and getting some, some teaching from, from experts in their field who are also thinking Christianly about it. So that, I think, is the way forward for Christian higher education. It's not to try and establish a Christian university, although, I mean, I've got colleagues who do think that would be a good idea. I think you create a whole load of practical problems for yourself which you just don't need to waste time on, but we do need to be putting effort into parallel education. Uh, alongside of things. And there are, there are instances of that. There are moves. So, for example, over at Tyndale House here in Cambridge, there's been a summer school in law for a while, which uh, Jonathan Chaplin has run with, with friends and colleagues. Uh, you can, the models exist already. There are models in the, I think, in, in the Netherlands of a sort of a gap year program for Christian students before they go up to university. Wouldn't it be great if we could set something like that up? That's what I think, that's my own view of the, the best way forward. I've got one last question written down here, and then I'm going to be coming over to you on, on the floor for some more. Uh, this is for Paul. Uh, you mentioned uh, churches uh, providing interest-free loans to fellow church members or non-members. How do you envisage this being set up? Would it be on a credit union basis or are there any other models? Okay, so you're going to hear a view from an uh, avowed congregationalist. Uh, where a membership of a church is defined and you know whether you're a member or you're not and you are disciplined if you don't obey the ethical rules of the uh, New Testament in a, um, or rep uh, without uh, repentance. So therefore, in such a congregation, I'm an elder of a Baptist church, I know who I'm praying for, who the membership is and who isn't, even if they are attending. Uh, that such a congregation can first of all and usually does have a fund for hardship uh, whereby those in need come for grants and help uh, that are one-off and gifts. Uh, the strange thing is that if you look in the Bible, we think that's what charity is. And there aren't that many references to gifts there's plenty to, of, about sacrifice in the temple, but not that much about giving. Uh, if anything, there's a bigger emphasis on interest-free lending. And this is a core plank of the Old Testament welfare system, uh, but also gets uh, brought up by Christ uh, in Luke 6, uh, when he says, uh, lend, to the, uh, lend without expectation of return clearly a reference to not just take what uh, the Jewish society around is doing on interest-free lending, but then go uh, beyond that in a sign of love. So, first of all, it would, 
That implies that, as well as a grant fund, a hardship fund, uh, churches should have an interest-free loan fund uh, for members. Um, why have we got uh, all our money in banks and uh, paying very little uh, to us at the moment anyway, uh, when we can uh, invest in each other and get other people in our congregations out of debt uh, quicker through that process? Um, interestingly, there are three explicit promises of blessing in the Psalms to those who lend interest-free. So if you're mining the text for uh, blessings of God, then why aren't you lending uh, interest-free? Uh, however, of course, you have to be aware that uh, debt and, and lending involves a relationship. And you've got to be very careful about how that relationship is conducted. And the lender must never act as though you've got to repay at all costs and you squeeze somebody who may not be able to repay. So my favorite quote from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 15, uh, Jeremiah says, I have neither lent nor borrowed, and yet still everyone hates me. And it's this idea that if you're not careful, lending or borrowing can get you into trouble. Um, Neither lender nor a borrower be, just to make sure, is in Hamlet, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> so, but 90% of people I come across think it is in the Bible somewhere, but it's a strange thing. Um, so yeah, go in with eyes open that this is, uh, a real, can be a relationally complicated thing. When somebody says, oh, I can't repay now, what do you do? And think about that beforehand. And also, don't forget, you may have lent to somebody who then ceases to be a member of your church. Um, then we come on to what do you do... Oh, just, just to note also that um, synagogues, of course, take this extraordinarily seriously. And so this is why Jewish migrant communities tend to be able to set up businesses much quicker than everyone else, because the synagogue acts as an interest-free loan fund first. Um, unfortunately, Christians haven't uh, read the Old Testament enough to copy that. Um, when it comes to the community, it then becomes uh, a more complicated thing because you're obviously dealing with non-members, non-Christians who aren't necessarily taking on those ethical standards. And so uh, those elements could involve uh, either microfinance or credit union structures that are designed to... Uh, in, provide cheaper finance uh, for people to get out of debt uh, in, in the wider community, uh, whilst trying to share the gospel uh, with this idea of debt cancellation and debt release. Now, for me, who's a sort of structural critique of interest, uh, credit unions, for administrative cost reasons, work on a, an interest basis. And so whilst better than banks, um, I'm still a bit uncomfortable that the lender is taking a reward, a gain, from the debt slavery of another. So I'm, always, I'm saying this is a sort of better than commercial debt, but not, I think, the ideal. Um, but for practical reasons, if you're going to fund this, you, you need to perhaps uh, run it initially on an interest basis. But those are the things you can start thinking about. But I, I would, if you're a church member, I'd be saying, why aren't you thinking about interest-free loans within the congregation? Why aren't you thinking about at least taking equity stakes in the houses of first-time buyers in your congregation? Why are, you, why are they loading themselves up with big debt when people in the congregation could buy a 5% share in their house and help them get into a house and only need to put much less down whilst renting the rest of the house to fellow members. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can think about those things. Right. So. Um, I think the only point I'd put back to you, Julian, <laughs> on your Christian university point is that if you think about a relational university, 
and you think about um, thinking about all the relationships involved in geography or particularly, obviously, social geography, um, history, economics, the law, and so on, there is an enormous amount of content that you would want to consider in a relational law degree, simply because just about every legal transaction involves key elements of relationship that would need to be deconstructed and, and analyzed. You then want to subject the, the relationships that are set up by various legal arrangements, you'd want to subject those to Christian critique as a secondary step. But I think a relational law degree, relational geography degree, um, would need a lot of additional content around the subjects that we normally take as being central to that. Okay, so over to you. Questions or comments or observations? Who would like to start? Here we go. One here. Wait for the microphone to come across to you. Jeremy's going to be running around with that. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, you've given us possibly one idea as to how we could use our savings. Can you give us some others? So, you know, where we might earn interest other than with big corporations? Yeah, so uh, there is a Cambridge paper on this uh, from 1996 about how you think about saving and investment and ranking sort of the ideal things you can do uh, relative to this, uh, this approach about where the return comes from. And so you c the trouble is that the, the better things are much more time consuming um, in terms of the, the best thing to do is to try and invest in a local business in which you have some personal contact, interest, um, relationship with, maybe management oversight. So the sort of business angel uh, is sort of the, the, the ethically purest because you know how the, the business is being run, uh, how it's treating its employees, suppliers, and so on. Uh, and then you start coming down from that be for practical reasons. Many people don't have those connections, haven't got that time, etc. And so you can come back then down to owning property and renting it out uh, and knowing how it's being used and how your tenants are being cared for and so on. Uh, it's investing in uh, other businesses that uh, you have some uh, knowledge of how they're using that money, how they're treating suppliers. So there are um, sort of ethical audits of different companies you can invest in uh, that will say, is this company involved in uh, payday lending or um, alcohol production or whatever? And so you can, there's a sort of ethical process you can go through and you buy the shares of those. Uh, you can then go down the list and you buy a, a unit trust that will just say, right, ethical companies that we put in that filter. And then you keep going down. And so once you then get into the, oh, I'm going to lend the money rather than invest it, you're then into first probably credit unions where you've got some relationship with a knowledge of how the money is being lent out. Then building societies because you have more knowledge of either the local operation of, of the building society or, or you know it's property related rather than funding things you don't know about and then right at the bottom it comes to bank accounts so <laughs> um, so you you and government debt so you've got that sort of hierarchy uh, and the trouble is the the better things from that sort of knowledge stewardship not debt involved and so on are tend to be more time consuming and riskier so the system drags you down. It wants you, but through tax breaks, through uh, the way the finance industry sells its products and so on, it wants to get you into pensions uh, and life insurance products that you have no idea where the money is going, or into bank savings, where it's just, oh, we'll pay you 3% in a year's time, um, but you don't know what that money is being used for, and oh, I've now realized that the taxpayer is standing behind this but didn't know it. And so the difficulty is we're getting drawn into 
debt-based savings, but not understanding that there are costs that come from that, but we're not paying those costs because we're either going to inflate the debt away or it's going to get bailed out. Another question. Yes, yes from over there. Jane? Um, we've talked a lot about debt cancellation, um, and biblically we, we would like to look at seven years. Um, but um, from sort of what I'm involved with, with sort of credit unions, um, we're seeing an awful lot of people who are getting very quickly into getting their debts cancelled with debt redemption orders, administrative orders, and they just go and repeat the exercise, which basically means the likes of us as not-for-profits are, are missing out because we're included in all that. Um, and I think uh, Christians Against Poverty, when I spoke to them the other day, having been involved with them for almost from the start, are looking at if people can't pay off their debts within two years, then they would push them towards bankruptcy or IVA, which I was slightly horrified at as a Christian organization. So I think, you know, there, there is this, we're encouraging people to take debt and then decide that they're not going to repay it. And then doing it all over again. So I think, you know, that, that that's to sort of temper the argument of, you know, let's give people a, an easy way out. Um, again, with the sort of um, credit union hat on, um, as, as it started as a, as a sort of a Christian project, um, we very much looked at the hardship idea and shouldn't this be used in churches, perhaps instead of hardship funds, um, be knowing uh, f from my bit of experience within the church that you tended to get the same people coming for the handouts year after year, and it gave people the, oppor the, the opportunity to, to, to lend through another organization, so they were encouraged to actually start paying off and do some money management and that sort of thing. So I think there's, there's, there's that element, you know, something it, t to lend rather than continually do the charity bit. And interestingly, um, that um, where I am in Essex, the Roman Catholic bishop, because he knows we need more money to lend, has committed to finding us 250 people by the end of the year to put a thousand pounds in, um, which is rather more support than I'm getting from um, the Anglicans, who's whose project it was to begin with, who, you, who are charging us a wallop of rent and, and are not hugely keen to encourage use of their premises, though certain clergy obviously are. But, the, the, you know, they're not willing to get, it, to get behind it. And I think, you know, we talk about credit unions. We've got very different credit unions from those that can give you a mortgage and ISA and do your insurance down to the ones that will only lend to you if you've been saving for the last three months and then they give you double what you've what got, you've got. And I think that's where the sort of Christian and relationship thing comes in because we're still human beings people deal with and therefore we're enable, okay, within the regulations from the Bank of England, which are getting tougher and tougher, to, to to interpret that with a deal of compassion. Therefore, you know, we've recently paid off Wonga and saved somebody's house. Um, we've saved hundreds of people's rental properties and saved Essex probably, well, tens of millions. But the thing is then, how do you get them to recognize that and actually support you in what you're doing? Sorry, that was a bit long, but, but <laughs> thank you. Yeah, just to um, perhaps give a, a, a bit of a, an agreement with this idea about uh, debt cancellation. Um, as I was saying, there's a strong emphasis on repayment of debt. Non-payment of debt is theft uh, and is a wicked thing, so Psalm says. And so you get this sort of strange uh, dualism within Scripture. Debt needs to be repaid but can be cancelled uh, sort of a seven-year cancellation. Um, and that is, I, I like to finish talks about that is what the gospel is. Uh, we're all in billions of pounds equivalent of debt to God through sin. We're never going to pay. Uh, if Jesus talks about this in various parables. And yet God is going to hold us to account and say, right, pay up now. And we won't be able to. And yet... Through the cross, that note of debt is cancelled, 
uh, Colossians 2.13, Paul specifically says, your debt is cancelled on the cross uh, through faith in Christ. And so that's why the gospel is this dualism. Debt should be paid and yet can be cancelled. And that's why all this language is fertile territory for uh, the gospel. Um, Just to note that for a Christian, uh, I would say that they should never use personal bankruptcy, administrative orders, whatever, to get out of debt that they have incurred, uh, eyes wide open. Uh, It may be used to buy them time so that circumstances uh, change for when circumstances change, but that debt is a a duty of honor. You've given your promise, your word, and therefore you should not seek to cancel debt through personal administration and walk away. That is a debt of honor still before God. And so, yes, you may claim that, oh, I can never repay if exorbitant interest charges build up and so on. There, There may be circumstances where that's not just... Uh, but you should be seeking to repay all your debt. It is ironic that, for instance, the equivalent of The Apprentice in the U.S. is hosted by uh, a man who has, is, ho- is held up as a great entrepreneur, Donald Trump, but who's overseen companies that have still got billions of pounds of debt outstanding through corporate bankruptcy. He is not seeking to repay those debts, and yet is held up as the epitome of the great entrepreneur. It is a false society that celebrates the cancellation of debt in that irresponsible way. There's there's one really important difference between the Old Testament and the sort of ideas we've been talking about about the cancellation of debt, which is that within the Old Testament model, the, the, the cancellation of debt is predictable It comes on a cyclical basis, which means you plan for it. You structure your economy around it. You know it's going to happen. And the examples we've discussed about, you know, possibly wiping off student debt or possibly we have we have situations where somebody really can't repay and and the the debt's written off and then they come back to the credit union a few years later and they want it all over again. These are random instances of debt cancellation and they, they work in a totally different way and they actually work in some cases unjustly. So I think the real challenge for us is to think through what does the Old Testament model of this cyclical process, predictable process of debt cancellation due to the economy, and how can we try to capture some of those insights in, in our modern structures, uh, which, which don't allow for that type of cyclical process. Time for one more question from the floor, and uh, uh, gentleman at the back. Yes, next to Nigel. Now, I may be speaking from ignorance because I don't know exactly what credit action does, but there's a tremendous need, apart from uh, debt counselling, <clears throat> for people to really understand what debt and, and credit is. <coughs> Excuse me. And I just wondered, starting with schools, whether any thought had been given to, to preparing a, a resource um, or, or, or um, training programme with, within schools about these issues. And it seems to me a great opportunity for um, the, the theology and ideas that the, um, the centre want to pr- promote yes. to be a part of that literature. Yes, it, it is actually, that is exactly what uh, uh, Credit Action are doing now. I think certainly, I think every student in the land, when they first come to university, they'll get a pack from Credit Action explaining to them the kind of that educational introduction to, to debt and to money management and, and so on. Um, at the school level, there might well be something as well. Yeah, um, when we started Credit Action, which was about 1989, 1990, just after the Big Bang and so on, um, we managed to get um, some money. Uh, I think it came out of NatWest, which obviously was a doubtful source, but we managed to get material on um, how to handle consumer credit and and the whole issue of debt into about a third of all secondary schools in Britain um, into the, what was it called, the PHSE part of the course um, or whatever it was called at that time. 
So the difficulty we had in running Credit Action was how you funded it. We originally called it free, the Freedom from Debt campaign, but all the people who we hoped might fund it, of course, were in debt <laughs> because they were the ones who wanted to get free from debt and therefore they couldn't fund it. So we had a major problem with how to fund that. We hence changed the name to Credit Action. Um, but we were really a freedom from debt campaign and we were trying to think about how you warn people against debt and also how you campaign publicly with governments and, and in the media against debt to try and restrain debt. We also were trying to get somebody, it was, his name was Keith Tonda, into as many churches and Christian conferences as possible to speak about it to the Christian community. And indeed, Keith did an amazing job for the next 20 years getting around churches and Christian conferences speaking widely about the dangers of debt. Now, I think we, you know, much more could have been done if one could have found ways to fund it, but um, that's, that's what happened. And today, uh, it's, I think, no longer a Christian-based um, charity. I think it's paid for by um, the major London clearing banks who use them as a source of information on levels of indebtedness and they are still trying to get information out into the public arena about the levels of debt and dangers of debt. They're now quite a big organization with quite a lot of um, counseling capacity as well.